Okay, thanks everyone for coming to the ISL colloquium today. We're uh, very happy to have Yi Hong Wook here uh, talking to us from Yale University, and he'll be telling us about some uh, a sequence of recent works in the in planted assignment problem. Um, so please take it away. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. So uh, let me get full screen. Uh, yeah, so I present some uh, recent results on. Uh, 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 a number of problems, which I call them uh, planted assignment problems. So um, these are joint work with uh, uh, Jian Ding at Penn, Jiaming Xu, Ben Yang, and Tofi Yu at the University. So uh, I'll start with the overview of this in contrast with uh, those uh, planted problems, which are uh, better understood. So uh, at the high level, um, there are many interesting statistical models that are involved. Uh, uh, you know, random models for graphs with the planted structure. By planted structure, I simply meant there is a ground truth uh, that of course uh, governs the distribution of the observed data. So, uh, for instance, uh, one of the uh, leading example is the problem of community detection, where stochastic block model is a very useful uh, tool to model graphs with latent community structure. Right, so here, for instance, in this picture, there are uh, nodes divided into uh, separate groups where uh, the edges within the groups tends to be denser than from outside. So the goal in this problem, as in many other problems, is try to recover the latent structure from the noisy observation. In this case, the latent structure is the community membership, uh, but it could be different uh, for various different problems. So um, perhaps the, uh, the, 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 uh, the classic, the most classical example along this line is the planted the clique model in a strain graph where the latent structure is a clique, uniformly chosen at random from a background strain graph. So this has been a fruitful um, problem to study, especially the compu computational and the statistical trade-offs um, stochastic block model for community detection already mentioned it. And then also related to, to those are the spike models for PCA uh, cl clustering problems for mixture models. Right? So there is a common theme among all of these problems, which is the underlying low rank structure. So if you think about your observation as the matrix or the JCC matrix, the graph, uh, it's signal, which can be thought as the expectation of the observed matrix uh, is a low rank or approximately low rank. And the observed graph can be thought as a noisy observation of this low rank signal. So this is the underlying uh, structure that is important for both uh, statistical analysis and also for algorithmic design. Design, For instance, it's essentially the motivation for methods such as spectral methods or convex uh, some definite programming relaxations and so on and so forth. So um, the uh, problems I will discuss today is a departure from these low rank problems. And in this new set of problems, which collectively I'll call them as planted assignment problem, the latent variable is a permutation of the nodes, for instance. And in this problem, there is clear uh, a lack of low rank structures. So the signal, if you th think about as Again, the matrix, the signal part will actually be full rank. So for instance, uh, there's many problems over the years that belong to this uh, suite of problems. For instance, uh, the Barpadet matching problem, which is trying to find the uh, perfect matching hidden in a weighted Barpadet graph. This is one of the problem I will discuss today, where the underlying optimization problem is max weight by pattern matching. And for instance, another leading example is the problem called graph matching, where you have uh, two graphs and you try to find the best vertex correspondence that maximally align the edge sets. So this is a um, problem that I will also go into today. And in addition to those, there are many others, for instance, where in the uh, uh, hidden Hamiltonian cycle problem, where the underlying optimization problem is, is the traveling salesperson's problem. The weights are correlated with the latent Hamiltonian cycle and so on and so forth. So there, there's a number of problems that were studied uh, you know, in, the, in the past decade and more recently that have this flavor. 
So today I will discuss two of those. Uh, the first one I'll discuss is the bipartite matching problem, which corresponds to linear assignment. And the second one for the graph matching problem, where the optimization is quadratic assignment. So I will discuss some recent results on these problems, more of a statistical nature or information theoretic nature, where the focus is more on the determination of uh, information theoretic limits in terms of sharp thresholds for reconstruction, where reconstruction is possible and when it's not possible, and, uh, and pay uh, less attention to the uh, algorithmic side, but I'll discuss uh, uh, the relevant open problems. So start with the first part of the talk, which is uh, uh, bipartite matching uh, and uh, related linear assignment problem. So let me first discuss the model. Um, this model was proposed in acceptance at all. About 10 years ago, uh, I'll discuss the motivation on the second slides. So here, the observation is the weighted bipartite graph, let's call it G. So G is generated as follows. So first, there is a, uh, so this is a bipartite graph of N nodes on the left and N nodes on the right. So there is a, a latent perfect matching called M star, and this is the ground truth that you want to recover. But M star, let's say, is drawn uniform random from N factorial choices, and then and they are visualized as these red edges, yeah? And in addition to these uh, N red edges, for the rest of the pairs, and you just connect them with probability D over N uh, uh, randomly and independently, and these are the blue edges. And then you draw the weights on the edges. For the planted edges, the red ones, you draw it from some distribution P independently, and for the blue ones, you draw it from some Q independently. Okay. And then the observed graph, of course, doesn't have colors. And the goal is to recover M star, which, I mean, clearly there's, it's, there, there's multiple perfect matching in this instance. And you want to find uh, the latent one from this observation. Right? So the graph and their weights. So that's the, the entire description of the model. So in the null version of this problem where uh, the Ash weights are identically distributed, so there is no ground truth whatsoever. And then let's say it's complete graph. And this is the celebrated uh, random assignment model that was studied uh, in a sequence of work. Uh, there was a conjecture by physicists about the optimal objective value for the minimum weight by pattern matching. So here, the, the leading example is when the edge weights are exponentially distributed. So the conjecture uh, was is equal to pi square over six. And then this was finally shown by Aldous in his uh, Zeta two paper, where he developed the machinery of uh, local weight convergence. So here the model we are studying is a planted version of this, where there is actually a ground truth whose edge weights has a different distribution. Let's say the weights are um, smaller and the rest of the unplanted weights uh, on average bigger, right? But so in the meaningful scaling, you want to understand when it's possible to find M star accurately or not. So the motivating uh, application uh, for this model was in particle tracking, for instance. And this was uh, the original motivation from the Chukov et al. paper. Um, so here, let me explain in terms of these two figures. So on the left, think about there are M particles uh, living in this unit square. And they, uh, uh, what is shown here in red are their snapshot at time equals zero. And then they start to diffuse in a random environment. And then you take another snapshot at time equal to one, let's say, which are the, uh, the blue dots, right? So here, without the identity of the particle, the goal is to, by observing these two times, uh, think about this as uh, two time frames from a video, you try to see which one is which, right? Which particle uh, actually moved here or so on and so forth. So on the right are the ground truth uh, correspondence. So for instance, if it is actually the same particle, uh, it tends to move uh, just by a small amount on average, but sometimes there are even some bigger displacement due to randomness. Right. So the goal is to observe uh, the graph on the left and try to accurately reconstruct this correspondence on the right. 
So the model that uh, was proposed uh, specific weight distribution in the Chekhov et al. paper was that uh, under the Planckian edge, which means the same particle traversed for a small amount of time, if uh, absolute value of a normal distribution, I think this comes from a diffusion model. Otherwise, for Q, which are uh, just two different particles and their distance is just something like the distance between two uniform drawn points from the square. So they tend to be much larger. So this is the uh, uh, meaningful scaling that I will discuss later. Okay, so that's, that's the uh, application. Hopefully this is clear. So here in this problem, of course, I mean, you can do some greedy matching by trying to declare a particle to the closest one, uh, or you can do something more globally uh, by solving maybe a, a max weight matching problem. And this is exactly what maximum likelihood here means. So maximum likelihood try to find the matching that best explain the data in terms of the likelihood. So this is in this model, it's uh, just solving a max weight uh, bar pilot perfect matching problem where the weights are given by the log likelihood ratio. Okay. So this problem is well known um, to be solvable in polynomial time uh, as a linear assignment can be resolved as uh, using the Hungarian algorithm in a cubic time, I think, or you can just solve it using linear programming. So computationally, there's no issue to compute maximum likelihood. And we're interested in uh, giving an estimator, for instance, maximum likelihood, how much uh, it has in common with the ground truth. So the figure of merit we're going to use is just the overlap, right? The intersection, how many edges you successfully reconstructed that are actually part of the ground truth. It's normalized by one over n, so this is some number between zero and one. Or it's also equal to one minus the error, right? The edges that are you included, which are not part of the true matching, and those edges that are missed. Okay, so in addition to understanding the behavior of maximum likelihood, it's also of interest, of even more interest to understanding this information theoretic limits. In other words, the optimal overlap among all estimators, because in terms of overlap, maximum likelihood is not the one that maximizes it. So, so there are uh, essentially just two types of parameters. One is the average degree, density of the model, the, the, the graph, and also the two-way distributions. So if you think about it, the limits will be in terms of uh, two types of quantities. One is if D is large, then the problem gets harder because there are more blue edges which distract you to find the red ones, right? And the second thing is uh, how similar or dissimilar between the weight, two weight distributions, right? If P and Q are the same, then the model is not identifiable. It's not possible. If P and Q are very distinct, for example, the red edge weights are positive, the blue edge weights are negative, then there is no randomness. You can find it exactly, right? So of course, it's going to be determined by these two uh, type of quantities. So it turns out the relevant similarity score in this uh, uh, model is the so-called Bakasara coefficient or the Hellinger infinity uh, in the statistical literature. So this is defined as the integral of square root of P times Q. So this is a number between zero and the one. If it is equal to one, then the two uh, law are the same. If it is equal to zero, then these two distribution has disjoint support. So this is the maximal dissimilar situation. So the theorem that um, determines uh, where it's possible or not is as follows. So it turns out the key quantity is determined by square root of the average degree times the volatility coefficient. If this number is less than one, then linear assignment works in the sense of the overlap achieved by solving linear assignment, which is maximum likelihood, uh, converge to one as the size of the problem goes to infinity. So that's the positive results. So complementing these positive results is actually the main result of this work is to say that if this condition is violated, if this quantity is strictly bigger than one, then for every estimator, the overlap is banned away from one. So it's not possible to achieve perfect overlap for some epsilon depending on the gap to the threshold. So this is true for both the sparse model and dense model. 
in the sparse model, the average degree are fixed. So are the weight distributions. In, in the dense model, you have to zoom in into a scaling that makes sense. So the, uh, the one that is actually non-trivial uh, is the following. So average degree goes to infinity, for instance, complete, right? And B equal to N is possible. And uh, it's meaningful to look at the situation where the unplanted the blue edge weights is on average on the order of D. Right? In other words, it's think about it as some fixed density, scale it with one over D. And the reason this is meaningful is because for every node, there is a single uh, true edge attached to that where the weights is on the order of one. And there is about D edges uh, where the weights are blue drawn from some Q. So the minimum of these uh, blue edge weights is actually competitive with the red one. So this turns out to be uh, the non-trivial regime. So this result was conjectured uh, in a previous paper, in a physics paper by Samarjan et al. And uh, we actually showed this conjecture is true. Okay. So specializing this result in the, uh, in, the in a very special case, exponential model, which is just the counterpart for the planted version of the random assignment problem, where there are two edge weights distribution are both exponential. So one is exponential lambda with constant mean, the other is exponential one over n with mean n. But if you take the minimum of exponential n, exponential one over n, you get exponential one, right? So it's competitive with p. So in this regime, the sharp threshold, threshold exactly reduces to lambda equal to four. So this was uh, uh, conjecture before in the paper of Moharani et al who analyzed linear assignment, and I will discuss this in a second. So in other words, in this model, if you are above uh, four, then you can achieve perfect overlap. Uh, if you are below, then it's not possible. Okay. So in the exponential uh, model, there's actually a very interesting phenomena um, in terms of the phase transition of the overlap. We know if lambda is bigger than or equal to four, the overlap is equal to one in the asymptotic sense. Uh, so it's of interest to try to understand the behavior when you cross the phase transition threshold where the overlap is strictly less than one, then becomes one. So it turns out that the behavior is uh, as follows. Uh, it's possible to achieve overlap by running the linear assignment. That is one minus e to the one over root epsilon. So this is going to zero as you approach the threshold. This behavior was actually tied. So one can show that the optimal overlap is of this uh, behavior. So in other words, the, the optimal reconstruction error is e to the one over uh, uh, root epsilon. So in other words, if you, if you think about the way you approach uh, perfect overlap, uh, the approach of this curve is actually has all the uh, vanishing derivative at the threshold. So this type of uh, phase transition is called infinite order phase transition. So basically finite order phase transition means that certain derivative becomes um, discontinuous. So in this case, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's of infinite order. So this result was suggested by the same physics paper uh, by uh, certain heuristic calculations based on belief propagation. Uh, this actually was shown to be exact. So let me uh, expand on this point a bit more. Uh, here, what is plotted is the overlap achieved by linear assignment. And this was analyzed by Moharami et al. two years ago using analogous theory uh, of local weak convergence that was developed by Aldous in analyzing random linear assignment. So uh, the nature of this type of results is that you can characterize the behavior of this overlap by a system of ODEs. Although you cannot solve it exactly, you can analyze the behavior, especially when you approach the threshold. So this is how we prove the, uh, the, the, the positive results that the error vanishes as e to the one over root epsilon. And this behavior is, is indeed infinitely differ differentiable. And the question, and that is the main results is the opposite direction, right? So not only is the overlap of the linear assignment behave like this, even if you compute the optimal overlap, it also behaves like, like in this way. 
and that is the uh, the infinite uh, order phase transition that applies to uh, the optimal estimator. Okay. So let me just contrast with the style phase transition in other planted problem that was uh, studied more uh, more closely. So for instance, in the stochastic block model, uh, the type of the phase transition uh, is, is not completely shown to be of this form, but it's their partial results and also conjectures that point out that they are either of first order where the phase transition has a jump or a second order where the curve itself of the overlap doesn't have a jump, but the derivative does. So in the two uh, community type of stochastic block model, this was shown uh, essentially in the, in the regime where the degree goes to infinity, that there is a point where overlap becomes trivial to non-trivial and that exhibits this type of second order phase transition. When the number of communities is, is big, uh, then it can have a discontinuous phase first order phase transition. So very different than this very smooth infinite order uh, phase transition that was shown on the previous slides. So similar results was also observed in, um, let's say a spiked Wigner model for principal component analysis, where uh, let's say this, the observation is the uh, uh, noisy observation of a rank one matrix where the ground truth is sparse. So if the sparsity is quite low, then the optimal overlap can have a discontinuous first order phase transition. If the a vector is sufficiently dense, then the phase transition is of second order. Um, so this new phenomena of infinite order phase transition was not observed uh, in this type of problems. Okay, so let me uh, discuss a bit uh, how this results was shown. So, uh, right. okay. So let me uh, just uh, maybe briefly explain the proof of the positive results, which is which is much simpler. And the, uh, the bulk of the work was devoted to proving the impossibility. So let me first briefly explain the analysis of the maximum likelihood. So this is very simple. Uh, it's just a usual uh, first moment calculation. So you first look at uh, matching that differs from the ground truth by a certain number of edges, let's say by two T edges then this means this matching has a higher likelihood than the ground truth. Equivalently means that the log likelihood in those edges that are not in the ground truth somehow has a bigger value than those on the ground truth. So there are T edge weights summed together on the left-hand side and T on the right-hand side. And if you think about it here, uh, these are blue edge weights, so they are drawn from Q. And here they are drawn from P. Therefore, the sum has a negative drift uh, on the left-hand side and a positive drift on the right-hand side. So this is a large deviation type of event, which you can easily compute each large deviation exponent. And that's how the Butter-Cherry coefficient shows up. Okay. Then you just do a simple unit over this. And the fact that this sum is a converging sum tells you that uh, it concludes the positive proof. Okay, so let me just go to the more interesting proof of a negative results, which you want to show that below this threshold uh, predicted by this um, Butter-Cherry coefficient, no estimator works. Right? So you cannot just look at maximum likelihood anymore because it doesn't maximize overlap. And the one that maximizes the overlap is very difficult to analyze. So instead, we turn our attention into uh, the behavior of the posterior distribution. So you can rephrase the problem in terms of analyzing the posterior, which is a random distribution of this Gibbs form. Right? So this is a random distribution over a set of perfect matching where the mass is proportional to the likelihood. So that's what posterior means. Okay. So a simple but useful observation here is that sampling from posterior is actually almost optimal within a factor of two. Therefore, if you want to analyze the error, whether the error is zero or not zero, you could as well just focus on 
the estimator that just says draw a fresh sample from a posterior distribution. So this is well known. And uh, it's a very simple proof. You just need to notice that the ground truth and this guy that you draw from posterior are equal in law. And also equal in joint law when you put data together. So this is just a simple triangle inequality. So the goal is to try to say that sampling from posterior is going to fail with high probability, right? In other words, rephrasing the same thing, it means that the object that you sampled from posterior is going to be far from the ground truth with high probability. In other words, you need to analyze and show that posterior somehow put more mass on these bad solutions that are far from the ground truth uh, compared to the one that are closer to the ground truth. So this picture is the following. Think about all this big circle as all the matching and M star, the ground truth is here. So there is a set which are the good solutions that are about delta N um, to the ground truth and about, um, and these are outside. So what you want to show is there are two tasks, two separate things. First, you want to upper bound the posterior mass that is random variable of uh, good solutions. And you want to lower bound the mass of the bad solutions that are far away. And you want to somehow show there is, uh, there is a relative difference between these two uh, posterior mass. So that for instance, what we showed there is exponential separation here. Therefore, if you sample something from the posterior, you're going to hit the bad solution with high probability. Right? So that is what it has to be done. So the proof of the first fact, bounding the mass of the good solution is relatively simple. It's a truncated first moment calculation. And the second part is, is, the, is much more difficult and the main contribution of this work, which is constructive in nature. So essentially we're going to find a procedure to identify exponential many matching in this bad set that are far away from the ground truth. And the likelihood is at least that of the ground truth. So that's roughly the idea. So this process is, uh, is uh, you know, part constructive and part non-constructive. So let me try to describe and uh, the main idea. So the lower bound, uh, you need to construct this set of bad matching. Alternatively, you can try to think about uh, the augmenting cycle type of things. What it means is the following, for every two matching, for instance, the ground truth and something else, the difference, if you look at these two matching as graphs set of edges, the difference is the disjoint union of even cycles. And this even cycle has to be alternating because it has to be one red, one blue, uh, so on and so forth, right? For instance, in this picture, the ground truth is M star, and this is another uh, perfect matching that does this. So they differ in a six cycle that is alternating. And in terms of weights, uh, here what we want is those alternating cycles that are actually augmenting, which just means it has a better likelihood than the ground truth, right? In other words, the log likelihood, total log likelihood of these uh, blue edges, which are unplanted, somehow exceeds that of the red. And this is a rare event, as I showed before. So a given alternating cycle is, has a very low probability to be augmenting, but there are a lot of alternating cycles. So maybe it's possible to find many of these uh, modifications, right? So these are bad solutions and you want to find long cycles because this is a difference to the ground truth. Linear in then. So this suggests a natural strategy is try to do a first and second moment calculation of these long augmenting alternating cycles and, uh, but it turns out that it doesn't work. So essentially the second moment is too big. So you cannot show just by the first and second moment calculation to show that there exists a huge uh, set of long augmenting cycles just because the correlation is too much. So essentially the reason for this excessive correlation is because once you find a good cycle, a long augmenting cycle, you can just modify a few edges and to get a different good cycle. So this, you know, in a way creates the structure of the solution that tends to cluster. So if you compute the second moment, it's going to blow up. 
So it turns out that as was done in earlier work for this type of constructions, it's better to do it in two stages. As opposed to directly try to find a long cycle, you try to do it by first find many short paths, but you need to find the linear number of them if this path of constant uh, length, then connect them uh, into a long cycle. So this is the uh, rough idea. And the execution of the idea is the following. And uh, you want to do this, uh, you know, this two stage uh, construction that has some independence between them. So these type of things is usually called sprinkling that you reserve a part of the randomness for the connection part. And you try to use most of the randomness to construct this disjoint path. Okay. So the rough idea is to say that in the first stage where I want to construct linear number of uh, paths that are short of constant length, but there is a lot of them. And each of them has very favorable weights in the sense of some of the blue exceeds the sum of the red, red by, by, by some amount. And here I'm going to use vertices that are not in the set of reserved. So I'm going to reserve a small fraction for second stage. I'm going to use the vertices in the most of, in outside the reserved for constructing the path. And then to link them into a cycle, I'm going to use the randomness attached to these reserved vertices. Right? So in the first stage, I have not revealed edges incident to the reserved vertices and which I will use in the second stage to connect them into long cycles. Okay. So let, let me explain these two stages uh, um, quickly. So in the first uh, stage, I want to find many paths, right? So here exactly what has to be found is the following type of objects. So I want to find uh, pairs of clusters of vertices on the left and on the right, let's say L1 and R1, L2 and R2, and so on and so forth for K pairs, and K is linear in N. And these clusters has the following property, let's say L1 and R1, for every vertex in L1 and every vertex in R1, they are connected through a good path. And the path could overlap in any way, because in the end, I'm going to use only one of them and so on and so forth for other pairs. So this is the, uh, the, the, the result of stage one. Suppose this is done. Now I want to sprinkle uh, the edges incident to the reserved vertices and try to connect this path into a long cycle. So this is just done in the following way. Uh, first, because I have to pay some attention to the alternating nature of this path, because for every blue edge, I have to follow the red, so on and so forth. So first, let's say I just want to connect these two paths into a cycle. Suppose this is a task. So what I'm going to do now is first, I will try to find connections within the reserved vertices, right? So for this cluster L1, there is some vertex in the reserved part that are connected to those. And for R1, there is a V1 that are related to that. And then they are followed by red edges. Okay, so I extended my path basically by two plus two hops. Then for this vertex, which are in the uh, reserved part, I want to connect them with, of course, blue edges. So like this, for instance. Then the resulting cycle is highlighted here. Right here is the main, the most, the bulk of the cycle is here, and then there is some small number of edges, which you go along the reserved vertices that connect them into a long cycle. Okay. So the proof of success for the second stage is actually not very hard. Because if you look at the behavior of the sprinkling process, what happened is that you could describe them using a, a, a display graph. If you look at the vertex uh, and edges in appropriate sense. Here, what I want to connect are these subsets. You want U2, V1, and V2. I, I can view, a I can create a graph where they serve as the node. Right? So I call this a super graph. So these super graph are connected if you know this cluster and this cluster has any edge between them. And these clusters are large, right? some large constant. And then the average uh, edge density is some constant over N. So therefore, the behavior of this supergraph 
is of Erdős-Rényi type, and it is in a very supercritical regime where the average degree is a large constant. So it's, it's easy to find cycles that are uh, long in the sense of linear in the number of vertices. And this is well known. And the difference here is that it's actually we need to maintain some color consideration. So this cluster already has a path connected, which are encoded by this red edge. So in other words, you want to find in this Erdős-Rényi graph, which are supercritical, it has already a built a matching built in into it and some long cycle that is alternating. And this is can be achieved just by repeating existing argument that is based on a depth first search. So in other words, what I want to do is to abstract the second stage into finding cycles on the supergraph and every cycle on the supergraph can be expanded into the original graph and that gives me a long cycle. And the augmenting requirement is basically achieved by making sure on this path, they are very augmenting. And then you just introduced actually a small number of edges and the resulting uh, cycle in the end is still augmenting. So, okay, so that's roughly the idea of the second stage. So the idea of the first stage uh, is, uh, is uh, a bit more involved. So let me explain it uh, just uh, one, one execution of this idea. So I need to construct in the first stage many paths, right? So this path has disjoint endpoints and they could overlap in any way. So the way to do it is just by a neighborhood exploration process. So let's say I have a red edge, which are two vertices that are matched under the ground truth. Let's say IK and IK prime. So for IK, I explore its, pros, uh, its neighborhood just by breast first search. So I'm going to find a tree, right? Then you remove these vertices that you inspected, then you grow the tree from the other vertex. So in other words, you can think about these two trees that are rooted on red edge, right? That grows on the left and right hand side. And the two sets of leaves are exactly these two clusters that I find. Right, it has this property that everything here and everything here are connected through a long path. So I need to control something about the weights. Right? So this is done uh, just by a pruning type of idea. So you start with the vertex, you explore its weights, and then you don't do it in a one shot. You do it, let's say in epochs of some steps of some hops. And then you do it for a few more e e epochs. And the reason for this is you don't want to waste too many vertices. So at the end of the epoch, in other words, you have a tree. And for every leaves, there's a path to the root. And you want to make sure this path is good in terms of its weight. So there is a certain probability that this path being uh, good, exactly given by this large deviation exponent we computed before. And then, uh, you only start to continue growing the tree from these good leaves where it has a good path to the root. And you repeat this process. You explore for each steps and then you, you know, kill those vertex whose paths are not good. And then you continue the growth from these good vertices. Overall, you stop when you stopped the entire path because it consists of good chunks of good path is a good one. Right. And this behavior behaves as the branching process with uh, large, uh, with uh, large, uh, uh, you know, average number of descendants. So it, it will give you a large uh, selection of leaves in the end. So that's the rough idea. Okay. So for the exponential model, this is fine for determining the threshold, but it's too crude for determining the value of the overlap. So here you have to do something a bit more sophisticated. So I will not explain. So let me let me use the rest of the 20 minutes to explain the second part of the talk I want to present, which is the quadratic family problem. So the, the leading application is cross matching. And here uh, there is a lot that we don't know, both in terms of statistical limits and in terms of algorithms. So let me first just discuss the Simulation. So the problem of graph matching or network alignment uh, simply means I give you two graphs and you want to label, label them in a way that maximally align their edge sets. Right. So maximum 
number of common edges. Uh, for instance, this is a labeling, and then you want to find the best. So the objective function, which is number of common edges in terms of the two adjacency matrix, is just this sum, right? So this pi is my optimization decision variable. I want to find the best permutation, the labeling, that maximize number of common edges. So this is the notoriously difficult uh, combinatorial optimization problem called quadratic assignment. The quadratic, as opposed to linear, just means the objective function, if you write as a function of the permutation matrix, is a quadratic form, as opposed to a linear form than before, which you can solve in polynomial time. Here, you cannot even approximate. Okay, but this is the problem that you ideally want to solve. That is the best solution. Um, in the noiseless case, if the two graphs are actually isomorphic, and this is exactly the graph isomorphism problem, right? Finding the graph isomorphism, which is this pi. So there are many applications in social networks, in uh, uh, analyzing protein to protein networks in biology. So let me, for the interest of time, just explain one of them in computer vision. So um, a fundamental problem in computer vision is to detect whether objects are similar or not. And a well uh, uh, used popular methodology is by means of matching the corresponding graphs. So the two graphs corresponding to objects are, you can think about it as a, just a triangulated mesh of the object. So you have the two graphs and you want to see whether they are similar. And if so, try to find the correspondence, right? like, like this, different regions map to different regions. So here there are noise in the, in the data clearly because there are deformations, right? Like here, uh, before these two parts have a very large distance, here they become a very close. So there are large topological changes. There are also small noise, local measurement noise, so on and so forth. So this is a benchmark um, application in, uh, in the computer vision. And that is just uh, uh, one of the mot motivating application for the problem of graph matching. Okay, so cl uh, clearly as, you know, uh, um, similar to the previous problem, the a uh, decision variable is a permutation which takes n factorial values. So you cannot afford to do exhaustive search. So computationally, it's it's very challenging. Also statistically, compared to graph isomorphism problem, which also we don't know how to solve at this point in polynomial time, uh, the noise in the, uh, the between the two graphs also introduce extra difficulties, right? So here, uh, what I want to say is that Although quadratic assignment problem is known to be MP hard to approximate, not, not just to solve, and this intractability is actually in the worst case. Right? If you analyze this problem due to, uh, you know, motivated by real data, which are far from being worst case pathological and actually well modeled by, you know, meaningful uh, uh, random graph ensembles, uh, the problem, which is worst case impossible to solve, doesn't, you know, it's not the end of the world, right? So especially models where there are latent structures, for example, uh, there's latent matching, which, which clearly is the ground truth in most of these applications. So statistical models here with this planted latent matching uh, is very useful here and potentially can um, lead to new algorithms that are, you know, have good performance in practice. So here I'm just going to focus on uh, a previously proposed uh, very simple model uh, called uh, correlated early training graphs. So this is just two uh, uh, G and Q graphs, which are has uh, edge to edge correlation. So this was proposed by Parasani and Gross Glauser 10 years ago. So let me describe the model in, in its simplest possible uh, terms. So you can think about uh, the following way that describe these two correlated random graphs, where the correlation in is introduced uh, through a parent graph that's called G0. So G0 is just GMP, which is a training graph with N nodes at edge density P. And the first graph is just subsampled version of the parent graph, where you subsample each edge with probability S 
And this is the first graph that you observe. So in the second graph, you subsample the parent graph again independently, and you get G2 star, but G2 star is latent. What is observed is a relabeled version of G2 star. So these two graphs are what you observed, where this uh, labeling is the hidden matching that you're trying to find on the basis of G1 and G2, right? So in other words, G1 and G2 are just two regular Rajwani graphs, which are uh, have correlated edges under pi star. So the goal is that given these two graphs or their JCC matrix, you try to reconstruct pi star as much as possible. And here the figure of merit is again, the overlap. So I'm going to look at the algorithm that spits out the permutation pi hat and compare with pi star, how many common matchings there are and right, normalized by N. So I want to make this as close to one as possible. So it turns out the parameter that plays a role to the noise ratio here is the quantity that is MPS square. And this is just the average degree of the so-called intersection graph, which are the edges that are sampled twice from the parent graph, which is just another arbitrary graph with as density MPS square. So the, the results were phrased in terms of this key quantity. The main result is the following, is the determination of the sharp threshold where you can achieve uh, a good overlap, actually almost perfect or not. And there is an interesting phenomenon here. So, the, so here, let me first state the results in the dense regime, uh, where the edge density of the parent graph is bigger than the polynomial in N. So here it is the, the key parameter, the average degree of the intersection graph exceeds uh, two times log n over uh, this parameter uh, by a strict uh, epsilon. Then in this case, it's possible to reconstruct pi star by solving the quadratic assignment problem uh, that achieves almost perfect overlap. So this is the positive results, which is analogous to the previous one I presented for linear assignment. And in the opposite direction, where you're strictly below the threshold in the same form, the overlap is actually not only non-perfect, but is uh, almost trivial. So this is type of phenomena is usually called all or nothing, right? If you're above the threshold, you can recover all but a vanishing fraction of the uh, ground truth. Below the threshold, you can only recover a vanishing fraction. And this holds for every uh, algorithm. So this expression uh, looks a bit complicated, but actually has a very clear in information theoretic interpretation by just comparing uh, the mutual information with the entropy. So if you look at the entropy of the ground truth, which is permutation, takes n factorial values. So the entropy is about n log n. And then you can examine how much information does your data, which are the two graphs, provided by the latent permutation. And the key argument is to compute this almost precisely. And then it's necessary if you want to reconstruct it even up to some non-vanishing fraction to have a mutual information, which is almost the same as entropy. And this explain the results and the determination of the uh, mutual information is roughly speaking the following is there are n choose two edges and the times the mutual information between a pair of correlated edges, which is simply two uh, correlated Bernoulli's. So if you approximate it, and then that explains basically the form of the threshold. And that's the story for the dense graph. But of course, this is only, this is just the information theoretic uh, results. On the algorithmic side, uh, we know very little about this problem. So the achievability here is through solving quadratic assignment, and that is not possible for the normal time. Um, the, uh, the only case where we actually know how to do things computationally efficiently is in those regimes where there's very little noise. For instance, when there is no noise, which means S is equal to one, right? So you just have two unrestrained graphs that are perfectly isomorphic. So this is the so-called random graph isomorphism problem, 
Well, in contrast to worst case graph isomorphism, we, we don't know how to solve in polynomial time. Random graph isomorphism can be solved in linear time. And this is known for a while now. So in the case where it's not exactly isomorphic, but close to by a polylog factor, there is a few algorithms that uh, achieve the results. But again, this is very far from what uh, is necessary information theoretically because uh, computationally aside, it's possible to achieve uh, almost perfect overlap when S even goes to zero, right? So far the best uh, uh, algorithm requires S goes to one. Right? I think the biggest open problem in this field is just to have an algorithm that works when S is equal to let's say 0.5. Okay, so that's a few remarks on this result. In the sparse part, uh, we know that the results that we know is uh, much coarser. So basically the threshold is known up to a factor of four. And in fact, the distinction between the dense and the sparse regime is that here, it's not true. Uh, there's a threshold above which you can achieve some positive fraction of the correctness. But in fact, it's not possible to achieve uh, almost perfect overlap unless this average degree of intersection graph goes infinity. And this was proved by Corina et al. two years ago. So here in this sparse regime, there's no all or nothing phenomenon. There is no more smooth transition in terms of the optimal overlap. But the characterization for this is not known yet. But if you only want to achieve, let's say, um, very similar to what we call correlated recovery in community detection, just overlap that doesn't go to zero. Uh, let's call this partial reconstruction. There's a conjecture, recent conjecture about the sharp threshold when this is possible. And that's exactly given by essentially the left-hand side is equal to one. So um, this was proved uh, by the same, uh, by a subset of the authors, uh, I think last year, in a regime where D is, uh, where S is very close to one, uh, but the problem uh, remains open, and I think it's a it's a good it's a good problem to think about. So let me just outline uh, the the proof, and here again the hard part is to prove the impossibility side, to show that no algorithm can achieve uh, you know positive overlap below a certain threshold. So this was done in the following uh, steps, which I can explain the high level ideas. So the idea is, uh, as I explained uh, heuristically before, I want to get a handle on how much information is provided by the data and compare it to, the, to what is needed to reconstruct it. Um, so the execution of roughly speaking, this idea is as follows. Let me look at the corresponding null model where there is no information. So in other words, the two graphs are actually independent with the same marginal distribution. And what I observed is the instance from the planted model. So I want to compute this mutual information by the following. And here, this is just identity, just by you know, telescoping sums. And what I need to show is that this quantity, which is the Kubalaiba divergence between the null model and the planted model is small. It's not uh, goes to zero, it's small compared to the main term. So this is achieved uh, by a truncated second moment calculation. That's actually the, 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 the most uh, difficult part of the argument. And the rest are, you know, have similar, uh, this type of uh, proof strategies was used many times before, is that you try to then connect the mutual information to the reconstruction error, usually in the sense of L2. In other words, the minimum mean square. Error. So here uh, you want to find, you want to prove a version of the area theorem where the area of the, uh, the integral of the reconstruction error is related to the information. So here, this is done by finding appropriate interpolating model between the null and the planted with some parameter theta such that the error under the theta model, which is between uh, mo, null and planted, uh, the integral of the reconstruction error is approximately 
uh, the m value of the mutual information, which I know from the first step. And then from here, you can show basically at every point, the, the reconstruction error is as large as you can, uh, which is basically the original variance without any reduction. And then this shows uh, this signal, which is, uh, so a pi star, just a relabeling of the JCC vector under the ground truth cannot be estimated in any non-trivial sense. And this impossibility then can be shown to imply the impossibility of estimating the, the matching itself. So the, uh, the uh, truncated second moment method is, is, is what is needed to compute the mutual information. And that is the most difficult part of this work, which I will not be able to explain, but basically it uh, roughly speaking boils down to studying the random permutation on the edge set associated with the ground truth that decompose it into appropriate orbit, count this orbit and compute the appropriate uh, second moment uh, when you truncate it on the appropriate event. So let me just conclude with some uh, summary and open problems. So let me just click this part. So I'm almost done. So I think uh, the, the, uh, the main message I presented in this uh, talk are certain information theoretic results that are proved for these type of assignment problems. And the proof strategy is in a way relies on certain cycle decomposition in very different sense. Uh, but this is roughly speaking, the commonality between the proof strategy. And we observe some new phenomenon that is not uh, present in previous planted problems, which are uh, certain infinite order phase transition can occur. So there are many open problems in this uh, thread of research. I think, uh, let me just mention a few of them in addition to those I mentioned throughout the talk. So for instance, in the bar pattern matching problem, we know how to compute the optimal threshold. Uh, we know the behavior near the threshold, but the exact overlap uh, curve, which is the base risk, if you will, is not known. And this uh, is beyond the scope of just analyzing linear assignment, which is maximum likelihood. Right? So this is a challenging, interesting problem. And secondly, is that uh, it's also possible to have finite order phase transition. And uh, although we felt this infinite order actually is quite universal for not just exponential model, which we analyzed, but for other models, for instance, where there's just no edge weights, the phase transition is actually of a finite order. So in other words, you have just a bipartite Ernest Rain graph where the average degree just a little bit bigger than one. And then you plan the matching on, on top of that. So then there's not just one perfect matching. And the one you try to understand, um, you know, how, how they are related to each other, whether they all of them are close to the ground truth. So we, what we can show is that the order uh, here is between epsilon and epsilon to some power, let's say epsilon to the eighth. So the exact order is, is, uh, is seems like a very challenging problem to determine. And there are extensions to other problems that are not just matching, but to K factors, two factors, basic like disjoint union of cycles and so on and so forth. So there is some very clear uh, physics-based conjecture about where the threshold is that requires, uh, seems to require, uh, uh, you know, strategies beyond uh, the, the, that is developed in this work. So finally, on the alg algorithmic side, I think for the problems such as graph matching, uh, is of great interest uh, to consider computationally efficient methods that are with certain, at least uh, go beyond what is what is needed right now, which is which is almost uh, uh, which is very high signal noise ratio basically, or maybe there exists some statistical computational barrier in this problem, which is also possible. So let me just conclude with the three references and uh, thank you for attendance.